matter? I'm cold. <laughs> and cut up with Kurt, he's cold. Something. <laughs> Scripture this morning is from the book of Acts, chapter 4, verses 32 through 35. And this is a way that uh, we don't live, but they tried it back then. Now the whole group of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and no one claimed private ownership of any possessions, but everything they owned was held in common. With great power, the apostles gave their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as owned lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold. They laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need. I ask you to pray with me a moment. Lord God, we want to honor you in all that we say and do. Open our hearts this morning to listen for your word, for your guidance, for your leading. Help us always to be aware of your love and your grace. Amen. My name is Kendall Farnham. It is my privilege to serve as lay leader of this congregation. And at this service, I know there are quite a few people that I do not know, because I'm usually on campus by this hour. But I am honored to be with you this morning. As lay leader, I go to lots and lots of meetings of various committees. And I know that Diane usually sits down, well, perches, I think, to to do this, but I'm not much of a percher, so I'm going to stand here. I hope it won't bother anyone. A number of times over the last several years at various church meetings, it's been mentioned that we need to talk about stewardship more than just at the time of our yearly pledge campaign, so I'm going to talk about stewardship today. We're going to acknowledge and celebrate how we do things really well and a little challenge for all of us in ways that we can do better. And that is a really churchy word, stewardship. We don't hear it much in our culture. You might hear a reference to a wine steward, maybe a household steward if you're reading something historical. So pulling out a trusty dictionary, usually an online dictionary, but they work, a couple of different definitions for you to consider. Stewardship is the responsible overseeing and protection of something considered worth caring for and protecting. Next one, conducting, supervising, or managing of something, especially the careful and responsible management of something entrusted to one's care. In lots of churches, not just ours, there's a tendency to use that word once a year in connection with our pledge drive. In our new member class a little over a year ago, George Altman came in to talk about stewardship, and he began by asking the group, what comes to mind when you think about stewardship? Pretty much the answer was money because that's what churches do at stewardship, is ask for money. But stewardship is so much more, and so much more meaningful than simply a monetary pledge each year. It's a lifestyle, a choice to embrace the call to follow Jesus and truly seek to live as his disciples. We've worked hard over the last several years to expand our congregational concept of stewardship to include more aspects of our Christian life together. Prayers, presents, gifts, service, and witness. And that's why we've included opportunities to pledge in all of these areas over the last couple years, and I trust we will continue to do so. So what are we stewards of as the body of Christ? Paul writes, 1 Corinthians 4, think of us in this way, as servants of Christ and stewards of God's mysteries. Moreover, it is required of stewards that they should be found trustworthy. In Genesis 1, God said, Let us make humankind in our image, according to our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the wild animals of the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. To have dominion means we're in charge of it. We have control. Psalm 24, verse 1, tells us, The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof the world and those who dwell therein. I would consider God's world, certainly God's mysteries, worth caring for and protecting. So think about that. God has handed this world over to us, humankind, and said, here, hold this. Try not to drop it. You know, sometimes we're a little clumsy. No pressure there. In our class, George shared some other thoughts with us, one of which that I still remember, so obviously liked it, 
Our stewardship includes our care of one another. And that I love. It's not just about the stuff or the natural world creation, it's us. So we are accountable to God for our stewardship of his world. That is an awesome, mind-blowing privilege. What an incredible responsibility. But we are accountable also to each other. Let's think about that scripture in Acts a little. The company of those who believed were of one heart and mind, and no one said that any of the things he possessed was his own, but they had everything in common, distribution made to each as any had need. That is the early church in Jerusalem, and that concept of sharing and accountability is foreign to us. We all have our stuff, and it's, it's tough to give it up. But we are accountable to one another for our prayers, our presence, our gifts, our service, and our witness. Hopefully those words sound familiar, because they are in the vows that we all take as we join the church. Here are some of the ways in which I think our congregation demonstrates wonderful, faithful stewardship. We are very generous with our service, both in and out of the congregation. For our week hosting the rotating homeless shelter in January, 68 different people contributed in some way to fill 192 volunteer slots. Total hours volunteered to make that one week happen in this place must have been somewhere near 500 and maybe over. The overnight shifts alone were 280 hours of manpower, people being here. Of 12 volunteer chaplains currently serving at our Mount Pleasant Hospital, seven are part of this congregation, and we have volunteers in other areas of the hospital as well. We are well represented in many or other organizations in the community, and I cannot possibly name them all. Habitat for Humanity, the Goodrow Fund, Woodland Hospice, the Food Pantry, Rotary Club, Lions, the list goes on. Yesterday, there was a celebration here held in our church building. We hosted our entire community for a Founders Day celebration. All sorts of folks were here learning about our heritage, marveling at the beauty of the quilt on display in the sanctuary, sharing food and fellowship. If you came down here, a guy threw pancakes at you. We are faithful stewards of this building when we show hospitality to our neighbors, welcoming all who enter this place. We have numerous faithful volunteers who work tire tirelessly to facilitate our worship services and programs. Let's see, Rob spends a lot of hours operating our sound system. Treasurer, light people, counters, musicians, the list goes on a long, long way. Arlene Dunham's sitting there, she's everywhere. <laughs> and I can't possibly mention everyone who serves or has served on one of the numerous committees that operate to help this church run, but thanks to everyone who does so. We are generous with our gifts of money for things that matter to us. We had lots of thoughtful donations to refurnish this space into the worship space from Fellowship Hall. Still some work being done. The, those, the painting of those partitions happened this past week. The other side's not done yet, but those look really great. And I know George was down here a lot getting that done. When our youth group requests funds for a project or a trip time and again, we've seen those needs met. When there is a disaster in the United States or elsewhere, this congregation responds. I am delighted to tell you that we received more financial pledges for 2014 than we had for last year. 121 general fund pledges compared to 114 the year before. Total dollars pledged are up by a little over $14,000. And I think in an economy that's still uncertain for a lot of folks, that's fantastic. Definitely something to be aware of and celebrate and share the joy. We did end last year with a small deficit, just under $4,000. One of the money people on the finance committee said in a budget of 400 and whatever thousand our, our budget is, that's pretty much a wash. So we look forward to a balanced budget this year. We will work, everybody's been working and will continue to work to keep expenses in line with our income. Sadly though, for the second year in a row, we were unable to offer raises to our church staff, which we wanted to do. We don't anticipate enough increase in revenue to cover that, although we would like to very much. And we hope that at some point in the year we'll be in a position to look at that again and maybe change it. As a congregation, our service is great, our gifts we still work on. As a congregation, we're a good bit weaker in the area of witness. That goes along with that dreaded E word. The idea of evangelism scares most of us as United Methodists, pretty much. 
We tend to equate it with knocking on doors, talking to someone we don't know about Jesus. At this point, we don't even have a group called evangelism in this church or explicitly responsible for it. But we are all called to witness to our faith in word and deed every day of our lives. Inviting others to share this journey called faith is for each of us to do. And I'm, this is my weak area myself, absolutely. It's something for each of us to work on in one of the areas where we can all be challenged to do better. We had the chance during our stewardship drive to offer a commitment regarding our presence here together. That's another of the vows we make as members of this church. Consider what a gift it is to the rest of the people here when you are here for worship. As we gather, we gain energy from one another, support, encouragement, love. When you are absent, it does not affect only you. Those of the rest of us here are impacted as well. So I encourage you to be here when you're in town, when you're healthy. If you notice that someone is not here, check in with that person. There may be a need we can fill to enable that person to be with us. We have a number of persons in this congregation who've pledged to pray specifically for our youth group on a regular basis, and some who pledged during our stewardship drive to pray regularly, some weekly, some daily for our church and the work that is done here. Each week we have in our bulletin, which goes upstairs, and I don't think we get that down here, there's a long list of names. They are here, yes. Oh, yeah, they get handed out. A uh, long list of names to be prayed for throughout the week. We read in 1 Thessalonians, we are to pray without ceasing. And we know our world, our community, our families need prayer. And that's another area in which we can always improve. I do want to talk some more about the money. Our keynote speaker last year at annual conference made a joking reference to our institutional reluctance to discuss money. He said, we have an unspoken agreement between pastors and congregations that they won't talk about money and we don't want them to talk about money. And that, that all, see, talking about money gets a little laughter from people because we know it's true. I am not, however, a pastor, and I am willing to talk about money. So here we go. Specifically, I want to talk a little bit about tithing, which is a very specific word which refers to an ancient practice of giving one-tenth. And I'll talk a little more specifically of what it meant later on. Um, tithing is another dreaded word for some people, and, and churches debate about this, and people debate whether you should, you shouldn't, because we're called to do it, we're not called. Um, so I feel more qualified to talk about this than I do about evangelism, because this I can do, and I do. Our culture conditions us not to discuss money with one another. It's considered a very, very private thing, at least our own money is. We talk freely about how much money Bill Gates has, how much some actor or sports star may get paid, and how they're overpaid or underpaid, and who should make more of the millions of dollars. I think as Christians, we should talk about our money. We are accountable to each other as the body of Christ. By discussing our finances, along with other areas of Christian life, we can support and encourage one another as we move on toward perfection. So why are we so afraid to talk about money? Jesus talks about it a whole lot. He doesn't discuss tithing very specifically much. A couple verses. Matthew 23, 23, he says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you tithe mint, dill and cumin, and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faith. It is these you ought to have practiced without neglecting the others. Luke 11:42 is similar. But woe to you, Pharisees, for you tithe mint and rue and herbs of all kinds and neglect justice and the love of God. It is these you ought to have practiced without neglecting the others. Justice, mercy, faith, Love of God, tithing. We're back to that disciple thing again. Though Jesus didn't talk about tithing a lot by name, he did talk about money a lot. That's his second most common topic, after the kingdom of God. 11 of 39 parables deal with money. I would suggest that having our priorities line up with those of our Lord and Savior would be a good idea. None of Jesus' remarks about money indicate that we should hoard it, keep it for ourselves, keep everything about it private. Both Mark and Luke describe a scene in which Jesus is watching in the temple as the people bring forth their offering, both the rich folks and a poor widow who puts in all that she's got. The offering is not a secret. He tells a rich young man to sell what he has, distribute the money to the poor. We are instructed when we give a feast 
to invite as guests those who cannot repay the favor. None of this involves keeping our stuff for ourselves or keeping information about it secret. We find tithing much more in the Old Testament, and it does refer specifically to the practice of giving one-tenth. Mosaic law required the Israelites give one-tenth of their produce and their livestock to support the Levitical priesthood. The word tithe comes from an old English word for us, tiagatha. It means a tenth. The very word refers to a tenth. The underlying Hebrew word is ma'aser, which I can't pronounce, so I'm sure that was wrong. Charlie and I began tithing when he was in graduate school, and we have done so ever since. At the time, we had a baby, and we were living somewhere below the federal poverty level. One of the things that we experienced at that time was a Sunday school class, and we studied a book called Rich Christians in an Age of Hunger. We became very much aware of how much stuff and money we as Americans have compared with much of the rest of the world. The justice and mercy Jesus refers to require sharing so that all may have enough. And I know this is difficult. We are surrounded by a culture that is built largely on more. Businesses spend billions and billions of dollars urging us to want more, get more, have more. But ultimately, none of that stuff that we get or have or hold will satisfy. It's not, we'll see if anybody here has read this book, it's not the little green pieces of paper that are unhappy. There. Anne maybe has read. It's Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. It's an old book now, but good stuff. Now the challenge part. How do we become better disciples of Jesus, more faithful servants of God, and love our neighbor better? If you've not made a commitment regarding your work to God, you can do so through this church. We have forms which list areas of interest. They're up on the welcome station, or I, I have some. They're from our stewardship campaign, but it's a chance to see some of the areas in which you could serve, and if you have a need to help getting connected with something, we will be happy to help do that and get you in a place where you feel calm. Consider how you spend your time. You might want to keep a log for a week and just check. If you find you watch 30 hours of television a week, I would suggest you turn some of that into kingdom work. Praying, calling, visiting people, Bible study, lots to be done around here and around Mount Pleasant. For me, it's the Facebook games. I keep up with quite a few people in various locations, but if I knew the number of hours I spent a week on Facebook games, I would be, I'm sure, appalled. So far, I'm not brave enough to check it. Maybe I should, which means I should check it. And I invite you, I encourage you, I have a whole list of words, beseech, implore, exhort, entreat, and I'll beg because I'm not proud, that if you are not doing so, begin tithing. And I know sorry, there are people in this church, I'm sure, who more than tithe, and wow, good thumbs up on that, that's fantastic. But I suggest it to you, tithing, as a spiritual discipline, as a gift to your congregation, your community, and your world and is a joyous and grateful response to the love and grace of Jesus Christ. Try it for three months if you never have. We have known several people who've begun tithing pretty much as an experiment, and as far as we know, every one of them kept on doing it, discovering that they can do it, that they like doing it, and that they want to do it. These are a few people we actually have talked with money about. Certainly, it may require an adjustment in lifestyle to a certain extent. I suspect that all of us here would still have a home, clothing, and food to eat. One place other than church, I've seen the word steward used that I've always remembered in one of my favorite books. I'm going to read you just a little bit. I'm guessing most of you have seen the Lord of the Rings movies 10, 12 years ago. And I hope that lots of you have read the books because they are fantastic. The language is glorious. Well, this is a few remarks from Gandalf, the wizard, to Denethor, who is the steward of Gondor. He has charge of the kingdom for the king, who is long absent. So here is Gandalf. I will say this, the rule of no realm is mine, neither of Gondor nor any other, great or small, but all worthy things that are in peril as the world now stands, those are my care. And for my part, I shall not wholly fail of my task, though Gondor should perish, if anything passes through this night that can still grow fair or bear fruit and flower again in days to come. 
for I also am a steward. Did you not know? All worthy things, these are our care, for we all are stewards of God's world and of God's kingdom. Thanks be to God. Somewhere I have some prayer cards.